Awesome. So does anyone not know who the Alliance for PE Pipe is? All right, Forrest, a couple others. So we're at 501C6. Our goal as a not-for-profit commercial trade organization is to advance the cause of smooth water pressure pipe in primarily the municipal water market. And we've been doing that since 2008, actively since 2012. Uh, and we do that through a variety of events, and that's what we're going to talk about today, how and why we do what we do at the municipal level. Um, it's really kind of exciting. Dave Hughes was in the room when the Alliance began in 2008, and he can provide a unique perspective to that. This organization has advanced over time to the point where we produce probably 12 different programs on an annual basis, and we now have these engineers on our staff. So we function in the marketplace similar to what DIPRA and Unibel do when they advance for PVC, they advance the cause of PVC and ductile iron. Uh, so we have these engineers, we work projects, and we help the distributors in this room sell more polyethylene and to do it better than would have been done otherwise. Uh, back in the day, companies like Performance Pipe or Drisco and others early, they had engineers that did this work but they haven't done that for quite a while, and now we are doing it uh, with civil engineers instead of chemical and petroleum engineers, right? And a civil engineer who's working here in Tulsa wants to talk to a civil, right? They don't want to talk to a, a sales guy like me, or a, a <coughs> professional who doesn't speak that language, right? So that's been a, a, a development that's occurred over the last three years with the graciousness and the funding of many people in this room. Um, so today, uh, I'm gonna to tell you what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the evolution of the Alliance. We're gonna talk about a few numbers. We'll talk about the engineering program. I'll give you a few case studies of things that we've done over time so you can get a sense of um, how we do what we do. And I've been asked to talk particularly about lessons and you know really what does that playbook look like even though you may not necessarily be doing it but you certainly know people in your companies that are trying to move utilities along uh, in their journey with how to deliver water without leaking along the way right <clears throat> so I want to say thank you to McElroy particularly Dave Hughes for inviting me here to do this again and also I want to hear it for Donna McElroy Dutton in the back row of course she's sitting in the back row and the reason we're thanking Donna <laughs> is because she keeps the books. <laughs> and we couldn't do it without her on a weekly basis. So Donna, I know you're a very busy person, but your time and talents are greatly appreciated. Uh, and we have a board of directors uh, that guide uh, this organization. And uh, who's in here besides Dave? Dave is now our board chair. I think he's the only one, right? So this is the group of people that my team reports to. We're very thankful for their service. Uh, we just lost Performance Pipe from the board. Uh, but yes, I'm disappointed, but they've been around since the beginning. They were in the room with Dave Hughes. And uh, that's a lot of years of support. We can't do it without the support of these companies and their financial contributions. So uh, it's a big deal. So what do we do? We have a budget of about $1.4 million. Uh, we build cases, so we have over 425 cases. So if you're in Oklahoma and you want to know who in your peer group, if you're the utility, who in your peer group is doing it, you can go online and you can find out. We have a certified professional program. So we take a group of between four and six people a year and we educate them to a higher level so they can do their jobs better. This is a kind of an intense um, study program for a select group of people that want to participate. We now have 45,000 names as of yesterday in our contact file. So these are consulting civil engineers and people in municipal government that operate water systems. Uh, this is a high maintenance thing. Who, who keeps a list? Who uses constant contact? How brutal are they? Every time you send out an email, they send you all the rejects. And if you don't take those off, then they won't let you start sending emails again. So this is something that we maintain on a regular basis. We've got the engineering program. We've got cases and leads. Dan, what is a case and what is a lead? Um, cases are general inquiries. So if someone's having issues designing a pressure test or um, 
looking at an issue that's non-specific to an exact, exact project. So they wonder how to do something, but they're not actually trained to do a project or looking at a specific um, installation method down in the future. So a general inquiry for the most part. Yeah, and the, and the leads are important to what we're doing. So we, and we share leads with the distributor community as we facilitate projects. We've got the podcast program. We started with only road shows, so that's a physical event. Uh, we used to average, before COVID, about 45 people per show. Now it's down to 25. Uh, we also do seminars, which are more intense one-hour programs, which we encourage the distributors that are engaged with the Alliance today to engage with us at, with seminars, social media program. Uh, the webinar program picked up because of COVID. In the first year, our average was about 120 people. Uh, per webinar. The second year it was 250 people per webinar, and this year it's 345. Now Dave said, how's the webinar program going to do now that COVID's over? I said, oh, it's going to go down for sure. Now it went up 100 people. <laughs> uh, so this is a learning method that's here to stay, for sure. If you haven't realized that, uh, it is powerful. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we do. Those are the various events. The engineering program, we have uh, just under three people because the other guy's not full time. And we educate thousands of people a year. We just crossed over the 7,000 person mark that we've reached this year directly. We work theoretical projects and we actually work projects that have names and budgets associated with them. And we build this constituency, that 45,000 number of people, we're building it every year by thousands. And I'd like to say we make HDP projects better, but we also make more HDP projects. It's key to understand the, the nuance between those two phrases, right? We're doing both. Uh, we're converting concrete, PVC, and ductile iron to polyethylene, and we're taking jobs that were already going to be polyethylene and we're making them um, And we do that through specs, RFIs, cases, and leads. So specs, we're converting specifications. We're doing what Dan said. We're responding to requests for information. We're taking the really easy cases and converting them to a lead. A PFE is a pipe fitting or equipment lead. And then we're also in it for the long game, right? Distributors, salespeople who are working jobs, they like the job that's going to convert next month, right? But they're not too excited about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Because Tulsa's taken a decade. Just ask Dave Dunn. <laughs> Tulsa's about still three decades. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. One guy. We're working on it. I'm not picking on it, but I'm just saying, Tulsa is a perfect example of what we see and why the Alliance is around, because it takes so long to get through people and get to the, the, you know, the key stakeholder that's making the decision, uh, or through the committee. And when you're at a committee level, you, know, you can add two or three years for sure, right? So we've built up our, our ability to communicate at that level with the various utilities. So I call this the key metric table. Um, webinars, so we did 34 in the first year of COVID. That makes sense because we weren't able to go on the road, right? And now we're, we're parked at about 15 webinars a year. And of those 15 that we're doing this year, 10 of them are new content and five of them are, are recycled content. Road shows, um, road shows, we'll, we'll do 25. We've already done 25 this year. We'll end up about 28. Trade shows, um, you know, think AWWA or the Great Texas Water Show. Uh, this year we will do pipe bursting in our booth in four of those six shows. So those are big booths, that's a big footprint, very expensive. Uh, and we, for years, I did the AWWA show and um, I tried to be a speaker there, you know, because I do speak a lot for this industry, right? And they always say no, you know, no. Why? Well, it's because AWWA is run by the ductile iron people. <laughs> and they don't want to hear about plastic. That's right. So now I break their pipe in my booth. <laughs> and it really pisses them off. <laughs> um, so that's been a successful thing for us. Uh, we do it now at ASCE, which is a civil engineering show. And we, we've done it for the last couple of years, Bob, at APWA, right? APWA and always at AWWA, and it's always a huge hit. We get hundreds of people coming into our booth. It makes a lot of noise, and it's really cool to see. Yeah, breaking pipe is a fun thing to do. So, so far this year, we've done 80 events. Um, Dan's done 36 seminars so far, so those are a one hour plus. And the cool thing that we're doing now is we'll do 
we do, we're on Zoom and then we bring in a distributor to be there physically present to do a, 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 a butt feed on a 1.4 or a 26 machine. Uh, one of our principles is if we're going to do an event, we've got to do a fusion. Because you don't get it, right? I mean, imagine you, the first time you saw fusion. It's like, okay, no, it's great. But once you see fusion, you're like, oh, I get it. I get now why polyethylene has this great unique selling proposition. So if you take a look at what we've been doing, we started in 2012 and I did a trial run on this thing and it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna make these people sit through all these animations. Uh, but this is where we've been. Every year, every one of these is a physical event in 2015. I mean, it's one thing to see it on a cute little Excel spreadsheet, it's another one to see it graphically represented on a map. And I guarantee you I did not show these slides to my wife. Um, <laughs> Because she says, where have you been? I said, oh, honey, just look at the map. No. Um, so 2019 was a pretty busy year. Um, and now in 2020, we add in um, the corners, in the oceans, we add the webinars that we did. Right? <coughs> 2021, another good year of webinars, certainly. Please don't be bored yet. Um, but this gives you a sense of how active we've been over time and where your money has gone. And then this is what last year looked like, uh, our busiest year on record other than this year. Um, we get around. And I've kept track of the industry members that participate with us. And it's one thing to have the Alliance go, but we always partner with, with others, right? We typically, in any one year, will have anywhere between 80 and 100 of you all helping us produce all these events. So it's not just us. Yeah, we might show up with the gear, but you guys are helping us produce the event. And then, of course, we have the compilation of all of those years. That's 12 years worth of travel and events and something like, I don't know. How many people is that? That's an event every four days. <laughs> Yeah, and since 2016, that's 19,000 people that we've met face to face. And these are the things that we keep track of. You know, membership this year, we've got 25 members, um, 164 total members, so 25 dues paying members, the size of our contact file. Everything is, is based upon the contact file, right? <clears throat> if you're going to produce an event, you've got to tell them you're coming. And if you don't have a good list of people, nobody's going to come. Right? So you've got to have a good contact file. We're up to 45,000 now. Social media, you know, COVID was really good for our business. Social media was great. Because I'm able to engage with you all on a weekly, if not daily basis, because we are publishing in social media so often. Um, and then we also keep track down here of uh, PFEs, that's a pipe fitting or equipment lead, and what that value is. Uh, so on row 15, uh, row 13, or let's look at 12. This year we've had 236 leads that the team has worked. 13, on row 13, we've had 78 of those 236 have gone in ground. So that means a project has been let. Um, and the value of those 78 projects is 55 million. So if Tulsa let a contract for 1.2 million, that's not what that is. The polyethylene value of the 1.2 million is what goes into that 55 million. So that's one of Dan's responsibilities is to figure out what that number is. Um, so we're not cheating. Um, so that's a legitimate industry impact number. And then over time, the value of all these projects is approximately $1.3 billion. We just crossed a billion dollar threshold last year. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. So. What have we been doing? That's what we've been doing. Uh, and that's what we're going to keep doing, particularly now that we have these guys, uh, the engineers on our staff. <clears throat> and looking at our average attendance, you know, pre-COVID we were 45, and now we're stuck the last three years at this sub-30 number. I mean, you're like, well, your webinars seem to be really, you know, they're 10x more well attended than the road shows. But we really believe that the roadshows remain critical to our mission. And I think the reason the webinars are so successful is because we were originally known as this group that traveled the country with a truck with 10,000 pounds of gear on it, and we were credible. 
instead of just hiding behind a screen and people not really knowing who you are and what you do. So we have a presence, uh, we are known, um, and just look at the average attendance. We continue to get tremendous uh, positive feedback on our webinars because of the content we provide. Um, and let's go a little bit deeper into, any questions on any of this? Let's go a little deeper into some of this. Um, Dave and his colleagues um, and Mike James, they kind of pushed us into using a CRM. Who uses a CRM? I mean, how much do you hate that thing? Uh, I tried it for a year and uh, I gave up on it. And then when we started the engineering program, they said, well, here's the money, but you can't use it unless you have a CRM. I'm like, okay, now I love this thing. Um, as long as you take the time to love it, it'll love you back. And it does. So this is, this is cases uh, from last week. So we've had 524 cases this year. So that's an RFI or a spec. Example, hey, a hydrostatic test. Uh, how does it work? So closed means we've handled it. Uh, this guy had a question on burial depth, questions on electrofusion. You get the idea of what a case is. On PFEs, so these are the leads, <clears throat> 236 so far year to date. These are projects that actually have a budget associated with them. Uh, and this is a specific question. It could be um, drawing set, questions about contractors, all kinds of stuff. But 70 of them are dead, 220 of them are open. And Dan, what's the value of all the open PFEs approximately? Um, it was 238 as of the end of Q2, so probably 250 million. Yeah, so we're averaging just under a million dollars per PFE in polyethylene value. Um, so part of what I promised to do today was also to give um, <coughs> some examples of some of the projects we worked on. Seattle Public Utilities, known as SPU, is a, a great example of a utility that McElroy was intimately involved with uh, because um, I had an old 28 machine and an old 26, and Seattle invited me to come out and do a seminar with them. And when I was done with the seminar, uh, with the graciousness of McElroy, I'd left them a 28 and a 26, which they've had now um, for quite some time. And now I, we just moved the, the 26 machine to Woodenville. Uh, but anyway, they hadn't done any polyethylene except for a couple drills they had to do. Seattle has now done uh, four water mains in hilly neighborhoods in downtown Seattle. And this Tolt Pipeline is a project that Drew Mueller, who used to work for me, uh, is managed for ISCO, where uh, the Tolt is a, is a water body or a region where they take like 30% of Seattle's water comes from that part of the mountains. And this was a failed concrete line that we ended up slip lining with some performance pipe, large diameter, polyethylene. Uh, and this project went in the ground uh, last fall, so it's just about a year old. Um, so here's a situation where we taught the engineers for two or three years, didn't take any action, then they did these four projects with water mains in downtown, and then they did the big one. Um, they just got an award from the Alliance in the showcase of last year. Very exciting, perfect example of how the system works when it works. Going back to the four um, major events that we do, trade shows, right? We only do six a year. Who do we see in those trade shows? Municipal staff and engineers and very few field guys. And what? We get a few cases and a few leads, but importantly, people that are walking by the booth, they're looking. And they're like, oh yeah, there's a polyethylene stuff I don't like. We do meet some people, we do get some leads. Road shows, we call this discovery level post initial exposure. So you've heard about it or you went to a trade show. Here we see municipal staff, both field and senior management, and we get plenty of cases and leads, but importantly we're building our constituency and we're building cred because people actually get to meet us. Whereas trade shows, it's less of a, uh, of a personal event. Webinars, we see municipal staff, we see engineers, hardly any field guys. Great for volumes and cases and leads, um, and we're building our constituency. And then the highest level of engagement we get is the seminar. 
but we also get the fewest number of leads. And here, we're hardly getting any staff guys, and it's pretty much all engineers and some uh, decision makers at the, at the staff level. So based on what kind of event we choose to attend or produce, we, we get a certain kind of yield. Um, let's take a look at the trade shows. These are the six trade shows we do every year. Uh, when you're doing 80 events year to date, it's like people come up with great ideas. You really ought to do this show. Okay. You got to fit it in. So one of the things I do at Showcase is I announce uh, what I'm going to do in the following year and get feedback. And I start working uh, now on what's going to happen next year. So if you're interested in getting involved, now's the time. And year to date, we've produced 29 leads out of the trade show program. So not terribly prolific, but those are all really pretty good leads. And what do we always do? We conduct the show, we document what we did, we work those cases and leads, and then we turn it over to a, to a distributor. On to seminars. Here are the seminars that we've conducted so far this year. You notice it's a mix of consulting civils and, munis and municipal government. And we've produced 39 leads out of that, actually it's about one lead, a little more than one lead per seminar. And once again, we conduct the show, we document it, we work it, and then we uh, give it to a distributor. Oftentimes that distributor, because they are often attending, they've attended about half of those, uh, they already know about it. Uh, and the other thing which is interesting to realize is just because we work with a distributor doesn't mean we get good information back because we're working with their competitor too and a lot of the sales guys don't trust us. Typically leadership does, but the sales guys and gals are like, really? You just did a show with ISCO, now you're doing one with Corin Maine? And I'm supposed to trust you? So there's, there's that that we deal with. So the information back to us on how well we did or what the information was, was found uh, during that event is sometimes imperfect. On to road shows. These are the road shows we've conducted so far this year. Uh, we're in the middle of a uh, Canadian tour, which you may have seen in social media. Brent Penner just had us up in um, Alberta uh, two weeks ago. And here we've documented 48 leads that we know of. Um, but it's not like I'm calling Brent every week saying, hey, did you get any more leads? A lot of these leads take time to mature. They go to the show and then they email Kim or Brent later and say, hey, I need your help on this project. We never find out about that. Um, once again, conduct a show, document it, work it, turn it over, or they already know about it. So you get the idea. So this is how we do it. So I was asked to talk about the playbook. This is what the playbook looks like now for webinars. As I said, we're doing 15 webinars this year. 10 of them are new content. It's, con it's getting harder and harder to come up with new content. Uh, but the program's working, and we've generated 77 leads out of that webinar program. The cool thing that you may not know about the webinars is we now manage it, we now manage it with the, um, the main show. For example, HTP versus Ductile Iron, which we did on Tuesday when I arrived here. Um, we had 300 some people sign up on that one. So we conduct the main show, and then we have what we call the bench. And that's a team of people working all the questions that are occurring simultaneously. And those are generating the, the leads, right? Um, so there's two shows going on simultaneously, two events that require significant attention. Um, all right, the next example is uh, the Omaha, Nebraska Municipal Utility District. We did a road show with Corin Maine there, I don't know, probably 2018. And they were like, okay, great, no, crickets. I'm like, oh, that didn't go very well. Change of the guard. Jared Vegara shows up. He's all in. He's like, this utility has 3,000 miles of pipe, and they have 1,000 breaks per year. Does this sound familiar, Tulsa? <laughs> <laughs> and they replace 10 <clears throat> miles per year, and their cycle time is just under 300. You keep putting in metal pipe, what's going to happen? You've all heard this before, most of you, the cycle time argument from Peter Dyke. Um, and Jared's like, he gets it. You can't keep doing the same old thing, because that's insanity, right? 
So all of a sudden, they start showing up at all the webinars. They get a hold of Corin <coughs> Maine and say, we need your help. Um, and we had him showing up on a webinar. Uh, Alan had him on, I forget which webinar it was. Uh, but here's, this, here's what happened. We did the road show. We were told no chance. There was a changing of the guard, which happens. They showed up at webinars. We got a new engineer. And now all of a sudden, he says, he said on the webinar, it's the predominant pipe. Rarely will you get a utility that says, oh, we're only going polyethylene. Because you've got to get everybody on board. Got it, particularly the field staff in these larger utilities. Um, that is exciting, right? Peter, what was the transformative moment with him to make the switch? What was the trigger? This data. It was the breaks per year. I don't know their water loss rate number, but this is, you know, you're running three crews full time. That's three a day. You know, fixing pipe. And it's just like Louisville. You know, I've been making fun of Louisville forever. So what they did is they dropped the pressure to cut down on the brakes, and they threw another couple million bucks in their capital plan to help with their cycle time. Actually, Louisville's cycle time is better now because they increased their replacement miles per year number and cut the pressure in their system. Um, what about Saws did the same thing? No. No, I don't. Anyway, so I think that was it <clears throat> for Jared. Even though he doesn't have direct responsibility for the maintenance team, Mike, he's got responsibility for the capital plan. So he gets the big picture. You know, so love that story. Uh, so one of the questions we get a lot was, you know, how do you handle these questions when you want to compare uh, polyethylene to the other materials? So uh, Dan and I put together, so this is Dan Landy, my engineer, and Bob Hack runs the trade show program. So if you look at ductile iron, you know, what are the key reasons that we argue that ductile is no longer the pipe? And one of the things I'll say early on is it used to be the state of the art, certainly, and it was. Um, and when polyethylene was commercialized in the 1960s, it was commercialized at about the same time both PVC and ductile iron were, right? Except we didn't pay any attention to the municipal water work. It's no wonder we gave it to PVC and, and, and ductile. But anyway, it corrodes, it tuberculates, it leaks like hell towards the end of its life, and you have water quality issues. And all I have to do is talk about Flint, Michigan, which I know a lot about, and it costs two to three, maybe four X, what polyethylene does. Pre-COVID, polyethylene was more expensive than PVC and half the price of ductile. Now, we are still the least expensive of the major three, uh, even though the VIG between those two is, is closing. Uh, and you show these images. And another thing I like to say about ductile iron is um, imagine, imagine if a guy came to you trying to sell pipe and he said, I've got this great product, it's called polyethylene, but I want you to coat the inside with cement and wrap the outside with ductile iron. But that's what Tulsa is doing. They're coating the inside with cement when they buy it from the manufacturer and they're wrapping the outside in polyethylene. That's what ductiles had to do to stay relevant. And it used to be a good pipe, but now that we've got PVC, PVC is better than ductile and so is polyethylene. But we don't corrode, we don't tuberculate, we don't leak as long as you do fusion correctly. And we don't impact water quality. And look at the stuff coming out of cast iron pipe. I'm not making that up. That's a Murphy Pipeline video that they gave to me. And we are generally half to one third the cost of ductile iron. That is how I talk about ductile iron. Um, ductile iron was a very good pipe in its time. We are still the best country in the world for water quality, even with our issues. 14% water loss on average, we're still better than most countries, except in Europe where they mostly use polyethylene. Then when you look at PVC, um, <coughs> PVC, and that's another thing I've learned since I've been doing this, is when you look at the nine major markets that polyethylene is in, PVC and ductile are really only in industrial and municipal. And PVC is also in conduit. And po polyethylene is in all of them. 
I'm talking landfill, geothermal, mining, industrial, water, gas, conduit, and I'm missing two. That's really compelling. And I have a slide on that in my 101. So in the case of uh, PVC, it suffers from cyclic fatigue. So that means it's like a pitcher's arm. You've got so many throws in it. You've got so many cycles in PVC. And when it cracks, it cracks like cast iron used to. And all you have to do is look at the city of Calgary data to learn about that. The joint separates. It's, that's the reason. As good as I like to think I am, the reason we got in Flint, Michigan, isn't because we've got a great product. It's because PVC broke on a two-mile line 16 times inside like six months from over-insertion. <coughs> it is brittle. In other words, if you hit it with a sledgehammer, it'll crack. This is what happens when you store it too long outside. And if you bend the heck out of it, um, you know, it doesn't do well. It gets its deflection in the bell and the spigot, whereas, in the, and they measure their deflection in millimeters. We measure ours in feet because our whole pipe bends. I mean, look at that bending radius. And yet we can go right around the cul-de-sac. <clears throat> but you have to give PVC its due because it is a very good competitor for sewer, gravity, because typically it's been less expensive to install. So we really only have two competitors in sewer, so it's PVC and CIPP. Um, so but we don't suffer from cyclic <coughs> fatigue. We do not fail in, in a cyclic regime. Pressure, surges, not an issue for us. Uh, we don't separate at the joint. Um, we don't fail when you hit it hard. You still can get a point load, you, but you're, still, you're not going to get rapid crack propagation like you do with PVC. <coughs> so you have a bad backfill with a big rock. We'll still get a hole, still get a leak, but it's not going to run like it used to. And our bending radius is 25 times on average what PVC is. So this is how I argue these points. This is a lesson learned from the Alliance. Dan, could you give us um, a couple minutes on the top five questions we see in the engineering program? We're doing just fine on time. Okay, great. Um, it's probably a good quiz for everyone to make sure you understand these. If you don't, pay a little more attention or reach out to me. But I'm going to give you guys some. <laughs> Do you have a clicker? No, you just had it taken away for insulting your audience. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. All right, come on, let's go. Okay. Uh, did you put the honorable mentions? So there are a few more. These are the questions that are most not necessarily frequently asked by you guys, the distributors, the manufacturers, but what people on the engineering side are most concerned about. So this isn't me saying these are the 10 most important issues. This is the industry. It's either most important to them or most misunderstood. So I wanted to make that differentiation really quickly. Um, sorry, Harvey, I didn't know you were going to be here. I would have called the... the uh, MJ adapter, the Harvey adapter, apologies in advance. So let's go through a couple of these. I'm going to focus um, a little bit on how we help address these issues, hopefully make you guys more confident in using my services and bringing us in to help you guys with some jobs you're working on. So I, I didn't know we were going to have a bunch of time. Uh, I thought you were going to give me my traditional one fifteenth of your time. But uh, we have a video. This is the number one most watched video on YouTube. So when Peter talked about all those markets, every different installation method, um, one of the really nice things about the webinar is Peter said, hey, I, I want to develop more content for YouTube. I want it to be accessible. Well, we've basically just been recording every webinar for three years and cutting them up into different sections. So uh, if you guys have an engineer looking at open cut, HDD, slip lining, compression fit, any installation method, you can send them an hour and a half video and say, hey, take a look at this. Let me know what you guys think. You know, give me some of your thoughts. But still, after all that, the number one video, connecting PVC using an MJ adapter, I like to think of this video as a bunch of high school kids sneaking out, their car breaks down, you know, everyone's, uh, I've done it like three times, I don't know about you guys. You catch yourself on YouTube, how do I change a spare tire, you know? I like to think the guys in the trench are trying to figure out, based on these YouTube videos, what to do in the field. So if you guys have any recommendations on more to add to our series, we're looking forward to it. Um, the legacy system, there's a ton of questions that come with this. People want to know, hey, can I fuse? to the existing pipe in the ground. If that's 3408 or PE 3408 or 4710, that pipe's gonna be able to fuse each other. It's the same exact melt index. Um, however, there are some older generation polyethylenes. We were asked by Boeing to come visit them in ISCO. They had an old pipe, 
some of the older people in the room might know, LLA. I wasn't familiar with it. Uh, but there's resources out there that are going to tell you whether or not you can fuse the certain products. I'm just giving you guys some of the complexity that arises with those issues and why we can help solve those. Uh, I'm not up here bragging about how much I've learned this, on these uh, experiences. So, thermal expansion and contraction. The reason I think this is the most commonly asked question is I think, you know, Peter talks about the ductile and PVC guys. I think they're knocking us. I think that's, you know, they tell their contractors, hey, this is an issue. And is it an issue? I guess if you don't know about it and you encounter thermal expansion and contraction, it is an issue. Um, so we just kind of like to get ahead and educate people to make sure they're using it for their best practices. So when we talk about thermal expansion and contraction, I've actually broadened it for this question. Um, so we have a really nice equation, one inch per 10 degrees per 100 feet, letting them know what that looks like. Keep in mind that assumes two different things. One, it assumes an instantaneous change in temperature. So that's if it's 100 degrees out, you're assuming that pipe's 120 degrees and that at night it's gonna go down to 40. That's assuming a flash, like from A to B. That's not really how it happens. So typically you're only gonna see about half of that observed value. But something else that's come to my attention, um, the mechanical strain, especially on your horizontal directional drills. I love horizontal directional drilling, particularly because every other pipe type can't even get in. We're putting so much stress and strain on that pipe. So there are ways to calculate the mechanical strain on the pipe itself. My recommendation is put one extra stick on that fusion so you don't have to really worry about nailing down to the exact amount of feet that you're gonna pull into place. But a really good rule of thumb, if you ever have a contractor ask you a question about this, if you're drilling 300 feet, put an extra stick in there, make it 350, but a really good rule of thumb, allow that pipe to relax for the same amount of time it was held under tension. So if it took you guys four hours to pull that pipe into place, give it four hours afterwards before you start even thinking about your final tying connections. Either way, you shouldn't be doing any tie-ins due to the thermal effects when you're pulling the pipe into the ground until the next day. But just understanding there are mechanical and thermal effects on both. We put together a series of videos recently on pressure testing. Pressure testing is what I consider one of the main novelties of HDPE. So if anyone's not familiar with the pressure testing, I like to think of our pipe as a heart. And every time it gets pressurized or energized, it just swells a little bit, right? Just like a heartbeat wants to allow for that. So we are creating a little bit more room in the pipe itself. Um, so as part of that process, we have to provide makeup water. And contractors, you know, let's be honest, contractors don't want to be sent the PPI handbook on, on what a pressure test looks like. They probably already understand it, but they don't want you just sending them a technical resource. You guys are distributors, you're pipe manufacturers. They're calling you because they want the quick fix, the quick answer, and they want your recommendations. So we've put a bunch of videos together that really highlight that difference. Uh, I've been making a huge push to include the data logger. Um, thanks to Steve Bremeyer and Dave Mosier helping us put that on this summer. We have some really good videos on uh, incorporating that. But if anyone's not familiar with that data logger, so you have the main line connection on your pressure test that gets you up to pressure. You provide makeup water. And there's a third connection, which is a pressure transducer. So your data logger is essentially telling you what your pressure was for that entire four or five hour test. You know, this isn't a guy the low guy on the totem pole sitting there with a notepad anymore saying 1152, 214 PSI. You know, anyone can tell you with that fake data, it's like a high school kid cheating on his lab report. He's just telling you what happened. And he has absolutely no idea, let's be honest. Acceptable burial depths. So this is extremely common in the gas industry, working with your burial depths. Um, so if anyone in here is in the gas market, don't think that everyone in the municipal water market understands it nearly as well as you. Typically, I'm borrowing from our pipe manufacturers, their gas guys, because they're so used to answering this question. But proper burial depths are important for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and we are worried about this compaction or the haunt zone. One of the things with polyethylene is we get away with really narrow trenches, and we don't put people in the hole. So what contractors like to think is, if I have a 12 inch pipe, I'm gonna make a 14 inch excavation because I don't need to put anyone down there, no issues at all. While there still are going to be limitations on the open design and burial, it's a considered a flexible pipe, so we do want to make sure we're getting the proper compaction and backfill in this haunt zone. So, although with polyethylene, we're getting contractors so familiar and confident using it, we've got to make sure they're not getting too confident and too familiar because there are certain situations that do arise, and the acceptable burial depths is what I personally think highlights the, uh, the difference. AWWA came out there. Second edition 
of the M55 manual during COVID, and they took this equation out, but it's such a great equation, and uh, they just made it a little bit more complicated. But if anyone here isn't aware of this design manual, um, they basically tell you all DR is 7 to 21, so unless you're getting a temporary bypass or some mining applications where you're just using produce water, uh, 7 to 21 in the municipal setting is going to be more th than 95% of your projects. And what they tell you is for all that DR, between 2 feet all the way down to 25 foot burial depth, you guys do not have to do the calculations to check for crushing and buckling and deflection. So we're trying to make things as simple as possible. Uh, this is a, just an example of a project where this, you know, the regional director for Tetra Tech, it's not just low level engineers having these questions. This is everybody throughout the process. Peter touched a lot on bending radius. The one thing I do want to call your attention to, um, since we have time, maybe two different things. If you guys have fitting or flanges, even though HDP is super, super bending, uh, at the end of the day, we do have, still have to go up to 100 times of the pipe OD. And the reason being, you don't want to have any type of stress on a, on a electric fusion or mechanical connection that's going to bend the pipe and possibly give it a stress riser. Now, when you're teaching your customers this, it is worth noting this is the theoretical maximum before you're going to damage the pipe. So whether you call it a minimum or maximum, I like to think of it as a maximum. Um, but HDP pipe, it's very similar to just holding a spring, right? I mean, you can take a spring and you can't bend it, but that spring just wants to go right back to its form when you look at one side, right? So even though we are promoting the bending, understanding that pipe has a whole bunch of stored energy in there, making sure your contractor is handling it safely, um, that is a real concern when using polyethylene. That pipe wants to behave very similarly to a spring when you start bending it. Is that all I got? Way to go. Thank you. <laughs> all right, introduce your new colleague. Oh, yeah, and Paul Fuser. Um, Paul's a long time civil. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Paul Fuser, 23 years in the civil uh, engineering industry. Um, I spent a lot of time with ductile PVC, uh, concrete, and uh, and uh, the least amount has been the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're happy to have you. <clears throat> so here, back to our CRM, which we use Salesforce. Uh, the webinars are the most productive with leads, road shows, mm -hmm. seminars, and trade shows. So we're paying attention to this in our weekly meetings. Uh, one of the big lessons here is events drive discussion. They drive the leads and the cases for sure. Um, and the critical step for us is to turn these things as quickly as we can over to distribution. Um, so it gets it off our plate and gets us on to working on other stuff because uh, we have, we have <coughs> always have a backlog. Um, another one I like to talk about just started is because um, we work with our friends at Consolidated in Huntsville, Alabama. So this utility uh, met us at a consolidated road show that we did in Birmingham, of all places. That's what I love about consolidated. I take it to the heart of Duckle Iron, um, which is Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama, right? Yeah. Um, so we did this show, we met this guy, and then I saw him at a, at a trade show, and he said, I really want you to come to Huntsville and do a road show. And we couldn't fit him in last year, so we finally went there this year. Well, they have 1,100 total miles in their system. They've got 440 miles of cast iron, but they're only doing a quarter mile of replacement a year. <laughs> and this guy kind of looked at me and said, what do we do? Um, I said, well, you got to do pipe bursting. So that's the only way you're going to get through all that cast, because right now the cast is all starting to fail at a higher rate. And they have three crews that do nothing but fix pipe. Um, so they're looking for a way. Uh, but He's the engineer, and he's like, "Well, we got to get these in. We've got to get these field guys on." And that's what we did with Consolidated last month. Is we did this show, and we just totally focused on these guys. Spent time doing fusions with them, talked through the theoretical of it. Who knows where it's going to end up? So we're early in this cycle, right? We don't know if we're going to have success. But I'm just sharing with you that there's, these things are occurring all the time, right? Um, then tell us about Don Liu and how we met Don and, and where we ended up with this today. This is your project. You keep trying to pawn it off onto me. <laughs> They're just tired of looking at me. So uh, No, so just really interesting story. This guy, Don Liu, attended a bunch of our webinars. 
and then came to um, a show we did in Washington, D.C. And uh, start talking to the guy what Peter's presenting. And I said, well, what made you start being interested in HGPE? And I didn't discuss UV radiation yet, uh, but that's it's pretty commonly asked. His issue with PVC was that thermal degradation. He sent uh, two, two, roughly $2 million a pipe to a few different jobs in Africa. And I always butcher the name, Bob. What is Congo's official name? Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay, I called it the Dominican Republic. Bob won't let me let it down. <laughs> <laughs> I called it the Dominican Republic of Congo. I can't make that mistake again. Okay, so the, the Okay, you guys heard, you heard it from the DRC. Uh, so they sent a bunch of pipe down there, and a civil unrest broke out. There was a bunch of conflict, and um, they let the pipe sit for about a year and a half. So they cut samples, sent it back to the U.S. for testing, and they, they deemed it unsuitable for, for water use. So he, as a, an engineer with the, um, the Engineers Without Borders, has unofficially agreed with his partners to, to start using HDP full-time that indefinite outdoor service life. So an interesting way of why he really started focusing and learning about <coughs> HDP, but that's why we've come into contact. And uh, we've got some generous donations already from our member companies, including McElroy and I believe WL Plastics is providing some coils as well. And ISCO. And ISCO. Yeah. See, this is your project. Yeah. It, <laughs> and so now, me. now we're asking all our webinar audience for money. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's working, but so we are giving back. Uh, we are going to conduct uh, a year from now, um, at least five people are going to go uh, down to help install this for a week. Very excited about it. Um, now we come to Flint. <clears throat> so Flint, as you know, eight years ago had a tremendous problem. They poisoned their community. Uh, thousands of people got lead poisoning. Uh, they switched water sources. The water treatment people weren't paying attention. The Increase in tuberculation in the system caused there to be no residual chlorine in the system for over a week, right? That's a bad thing. You, don't, you wouldn't want to be drinking water that had no residual chlorine in it, right? Well, so we go there, we participate, and basically all we got after three years worth of work was one drill that probably would have gone polyethylene anyway. COVID comes. This guy named Mark Adis, the engineer that I took to lunch a couple times, um, started showing up. And um, this is what happened. Let's see if we can get. So uh, we're in Flint, Michigan today uh, with Mark and his consulting civil engineers, as well as uh, several contractors to talk about HDPE pipe. Mark, tell us, uh, where did you start on this polyethylene journey and uh, where are you today? Well, we started out with we didn't want it and now we're we're looking at it very seriously. Um, I've been convinced with all your uh, webinars and that, and I've seen, I've seen the light, I guess. Yeah. Well, we, you're right. I mean, five years ago, uh, you and I spent some time together here, and um, polyethylene wasn't high on the list here in Flint. But so, what changed, Mark? What changed your opinion? And tell us a little bit about that process. Well, it goes back to your w webinars when I started going to them. I first was just out of curiosity. Um, but the uh, more I learned about it, I seen the value of it. Like I said, back five year, so years ago, I was worried about, you know, Flint's got a lot of pollution and things like that. But in reality, that's not going to bother us because we put, usually have sand around our, new sand around our right. pipes, so that's not an issue. And we average about this time of year about three to four in this early spring breaks per day. Three to four breaks per day. In what materials? Uh, most of it's cast iron, uh, some ductile. How do you like that? I said we've seen the light, or I've seen the light. Um, I haven't published that on social media yet, but maybe I will. So progress in Flint, um, Michigan. Um, so, looking back, you know, what are the effective tactics that we use? And I think the big picture is the system that we're using. It's an honest review of our product as it relates to other materials. Uh, we're not afraid to talk about failure. Uh, in fact, I like to say 90% of your fusions are butt fusions. 90% of your failures will be electrofusion or third-party damage. To impress upon people the importance of training. 
Um, one of the things I've learned from the utilities, uh, and I, since I've been doing it over a decade, is the early utilities that adopted the product weren't drinking the Kool-Aid on electrofusion. With butt fusion, it's clean it, shave it, heat it, fuse it. With electrofusion, it's clean it, peel it, clean it, fuse it. They're clean. And if you're not trained properly, you're going to miss one of them, right? So an honest review of our product, I think, is super important. Videos, once again, you got to do a butt fusion every time. Videos are key. Webinars have been the best thing we've done. As Dave Hughes says, you got to learn their pain points. Uh, to what Mike Leathers was talking about, you got to look people in the eye. You got to listen to them and what's going on with them, like in Huntsville. What's going on with you? We got cast iron. What's your solution? All of a sudden, you can engage. The engineers program has been huge. Been huge. Because they want to talk to engineers, they don't want to talk to me. Um, and that contact file, and then of course PE P e Showcase. Uh, we're going to, instead of the raffle this year at Showcase for uh, an undergraduate engineering program, we're going to use the raffle monies for Peru to help fund that routine. Um, very excited about that. So these tactics are what we're doing on a regular basis. Now let's talk about Fort Lauderdale, and I'm, we're pretty close to being finished here. We're doing well on time, right? Because we've got until 10 minutes before the hour? 3.45, we're supposed to be in five minutes. Five minutes? Four, four minutes. Wow, I'm going to have to talk four, fast. Four <laughs> so Brian Fletcher and I did a road show pre-COVID and pre-big disaster in Fort Lauderdale. So Fort Lauderdale had their main sewage line fail in the intercoastal waterway. Who knows what the intercoastal waterway is? That's a big deal, right? Now it's full of sewage in Fort Lauderdale. What do we do? Well, four engineers had been at this road show, so they'd heard about polyethylene. What do they do? They contact Camille at PPI, ISCO, and Murphy Pipeline, because they knew about polyethylene. $65 million later, their trunk line was solved. We're out of time. We're out of time. OK. okay. Well. We're almost out of time. <laughs> so take, take a look at this cool stuff that happened, these, this project. Uh, here we have Mr. C cleaning the inside of pipe, McElroy rollers. Anybody want to talk about tow-in? Yeah, we see it here on 54-inch diameter pipe. And we'll bypass this video. And then yesterday on my feed, what do I get because I follow the city of Fort Lauderdale? I get this video produced by the city of Fort Lauderdale on their polyethylene project, which was totally different. So at a road show last month, they said, oh yeah, polyethylene is in our capital program. We're pretty much not using anything else for water, right? And now they're producing their own videos saying, hey, we're sorry, Mr. Business and Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so living on the main street. We're using polyethylene, but we're going to be in and out quickly. So now we've got a utility, after all of that, 65 million, we solved their problem. Now they're producing videos on how great the product is. We're going to get Tulsa eventually. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any questions? All right, thank you all for listening. Really appreciate the time.